was dumb and I couldn't do anything correctly. I felt embarrassed at some times. Why can't I read? I know the answer, but then when I say it, it won't come out the way I was thinking. It's just hard. You just keep trying and trying and trying and you just you get tired doing it. For one in five Americans, learning is a special struggle. A struggle that often has serious consequences. I can't take this anymore. And when he said, I just shouldn't be alive, I said, this child does not have to go through this. Tonight, a deeply personal look inside five American families trying to solve the puzzling mysteries of their children's misunderstood minds. Funding for Misunderstood Minds is provided in part by Schwab Learning, a service of the Charles and Helen Schwab Foundation, dedicated to helping kids with learning differences. And by ExxonMobil, because we value creative energy in all its forms. The Spencer T. and Ann W. Olin Foundation, dedicated to improving education and the environment. The Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation, supporting innovation and diversity in the arts, environment, and learning. The Roberts Foundation, providing learning opportunities for disadvantaged children and youth. And the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, supporting educational, cultural, and environmental initiatives. And now, Misunderstood Minds with Chris Bury. Learning disability, a diagnosis that fills any parent with dread. At one time, it meant you had a lost child and no clear means of rescue. I know, one of my own children has struggled with a serious learning problem. It seemed the best worried parents could do was hold our breath and hope that somehow our child got through school. Now, that has changed thanks to a comprehensive new approach. Learning specialists have figured out something quite profound, yet simple. Each of us thinks and learns differently, sometimes with dramatic consequences. And research is zeroing in on precisely what's happening with those of our children who have trouble in school. Now, teachers and parents have more strategies to help. Tonight, we're going to meet five families who have let us follow them through this journey for the last three years. We begin with the story of a bright, articulate little boy who everybody figured would own the world one day. Nathan Van Hoy lives near Raleigh, North Carolina. All boy, running, playing, imitating, laughing, giggling, playing with the dog, wrestling with the dog, riding the dog. They say you can either die on the field or die in the bleachers. And he'll always be on the field, that's Nathan. He's always going to jump in and take part. And Nathan's parents were determined to give him just the right head start. Nathan had had a lot of experiences with museums and um, traveling and a lot of opportunities that made him very worldly. Um, his communication skills were far ahead of the other children. He was a leader among his friends and a standout athlete. Okay, so we'll get Ryan to kick it into us. We block. And Nathan block. loved to read. His parents had little doubt that in school, their son would be a star. Put the plan in it. Oh. Then his first grade teacher called. The first week of school, he didn't know the alphabet. His phonics just wasn't there. And mm -hmm. while I worked with him and worked with him and worked with him, right. it just, he couldn't hear the sounds. Nathan, the boy who said he loved books, couldn't really read. His parents couldn't believe it. How could this be? How can we not do basics if we can do overachievement kind of things? And I think it's probably the hardest thing any parent can hear, is that your child's not average, when of course you think that they're maybe even um, exceptional. Yeah, go ahead. Get out in the field. But deep down inside, Nathan knew something was not right. It's just hard. You just keep trying and trying and trying. And you just mm -hmm. you get tired doing it. Nathan was already aware that he was not reading on the same level that his peers were. 
he was very concerned with being judged or being held to the same standards that his peers are. Eventually, the school tested Nathan. The results were shocking. We were profoundly deficient. We were like below D's. And it was very hard to understand how he could express himself and be so articulate and yet score so low on the test. And I guess I sort of took it um, as a grain of salt because here was a highly functional, functional child who couldn't possibly be. It had to be he was tired that day. They tested him in an uncomfortable area. There was a stranger that came in and tested him and he didn't know. Just all these things that could contribute to the low scores. But they sound like they could be excuses as well. Well, I'm the mom. It wasn't what I wanted to hear. But it was a wake-up call. Lois decided to take a closer look. I would sit beside him on the couch and he would be reading up a storm. And I stopped and I looked at him. And his eyes were not in the book, but into this next room. He had memorized the entire book. It was a startling revelation. This child was able to camouflage his deficiency by marshalling an innate strength, memorizing. By now, his parents knew they had a real problem, and they reacted as most parents do, with a containment response. They would try to control Nathan's problem by reaching for the nearest available remedy. And in his case, that meant accepting the school's prescription. Nathan would have to repeat the first grade. To his ego, it was, it was very, very difficult. Uh, there were several times when we would see people out and they'd say, uh, Nathan, how old are you? What grade are you in? And he would say, I'm in second grade, when he knew he was still in first. Nathan got through the first grade this time, and his mom hired a tutor to prepare him for the second grade. Two weeks before school started, Nathan knew what he needed to know, according to the tutor. Did great. Knew 300 sight words, everything he needed to do to start second grade. Nine weeks into second grade, my child can't read. My child can't do single and double digit math, addition and subtraction. I'm like, how did he forget this in nine weeks? Nathan. In truth, Nathan had not really been succeeding. He had called upon his primary coping skill, memorization, to make his way through the familiar work of the first grade and the early weeks of the second. But when he encountered new material, he just could not do it. Nathan's parents now knew it was time to move beyond mere containment. At the University of North Carolina Medical School is one of the nation's leading medical experts on learning problems, Professor of Pediatrics Mel Levine. If you can Dr. Levine founded All Kinds of Minds to investigate the way the wiring of the brain affects a child's ability to learn. That has the word car in it. Open your mouth and stick your tongue out. Try to stay like that till I tell you to stop. Dr. Levine has come to believe merely testing for ADD or dyslexia is not enough and unnecessarily labels kids. We're going to all go get some coffee. You just stay like that for a while. <laughs> We're going to play catch with this little squad. His complex testing is designed to identify very specific neurological weaknesses as well as strengths. That was excellent. I'm going to show you some patterns with my fingers. In 33 different tasks, Dr. Levine looks for clues to how Nathan's brain is wired. Jar. In time, Dr. Levine zeroes in on Nathan's areas of weakness. And then I'd say three. Okay. Now I have a really interesting game. It's a rhyming game. So I'll give you a word. Hot. Hate. Mm-hmm. Does that rhyme with hot? Mm-hmm. Okay, what else? 
Nathan's trouble with rhyming indicates a problem with something called phonemic awareness. Does mate rhyme with hot? How about got? It's an innate ability to distinguish among the different sounds that together create words. In soup, phonemic awareness is just this sensitivity that most kids have that you can take a word like dog and break it into three sounds. D, a, g is dog. Doesn't that sound simple? It, it's almost not worth saying it sounds so simple and it is completely, completely elusive to a group of kids who are going to go on and have big league problems learning to read. Buffy kissed me over Buffy. What do you do first? He kissed. Um, if it was caught. If we watch Nathan, you'll see he's putting so much energy into pulling the print off the page, literally glued to the print, or guessing, that it takes too much time for him to figure out how what he just read, in fact, relates to what he already knows, so his comprehension is nil. These early difficulties portend not only difficulties in writing, difficulties in understanding yes. content. I can but critical self-esteem issues that fall much more rapidly than we ever thought. What's surprising to mom and dad and teachers who don't understand this is that he'll carry on a brilliant conversation with you all day long. And that's the reason they ran away? Yeah. get So you won't see it in oral language. And in fact, the youngsters will impress you many times as, because they are very articulate. They are very erudite. And, uh, it's only when they're confronted with the written language that it will begin to show up. You remember they were chasing Chase me. So, yeah, Chase. Oh, wait, let's cover this up now. What happened after it? Well, By the end of the first grade, we can watch and youngsters like Nathan begin to avoid and escape reading. And many kids will actually begin to look like they have attentional difficulties because of that. They'll respond to the teacher's questions impulsively, or they'll be distracted easily, or they'll come off the task. Not because they have attentional difficulties, per se, but because they're trying to get away from something extremely painful. I... So Nathan's parents feel they have an answer. A tiny quirk in Nathan's mental wiring has completely tangled his ability to learn. When we return to Nathan's story, we'll watch his parents discover that sorting out that tangle will be more of a challenge than they would ever have guessed. But first, let's meet a young girl from Southern California whose mind poses another perplexing mystery. Eleven-year-old Lauren Smith is creative and bright and at times more than a little exasperating to her parents. Oh, Lord, she dawdles. Mike describes her as the only person he knows who can be taking a shower and forget what she's doing. You know, and so she'll be in the midst of whatever she's supposed to be doing and she's a million miles away. Lauren! Time to get up, hon! The mind just wanders constantly. Lauren, your waffles are almost ready. I just pretty much goof off the entire morning, make everything take time that didn't need to take time. Lauren, what are you doing at school today? I don't know. Let's say I need to do homework, I draw a picture, or I dust my desk, or <laughs> paintbrushes, anything I could do besides tell Mike I'd do. First day. I went back and reread her report cards to see how her teacher saw her. It was things like doesn't complete her work, talks out of turn, or carries on conversations with her neighbor. I was thinking there was a problem with me and I was doing things wrong because that was what people were telling me at school that I was dumb and I couldn't do anything correctly and Lauren where's your lunchbox Thursday I I said it there All right, I'm gonna go check the car okay okay I was unpopular and I was quite lonely not many friends people 
They say that they want to be my friends, but they sure don't act like it. There was one particularly heartbreaking episode in first grade. There was a little girl who made her a promise. Lauren would be taken to Disney World if Lauren did all the things that this little girl told her she had to do. The bargain included never playing with any other children, and through the first grade, Lauren actually kept it. I found out she took a couple of friends to Disney World and I wasn't invited. And it really made me feel bad. What's it like to have no real friends? Not fun at all. It's quite bad and it's no fun because if you don't have any friends, then you can't really do much in life and you start thinking, what's the point in life if you don't have many friends? I didn't get there yet, but thank goodness. Amazingly, Lauren's social problems were, in fact, a vital clue to the nature of her learning problems. It's a kind of reading problem. Just as you may not be able to read a sentence and read it the way other kids do, you may not be able to read a social scene. You may not be able to see that child is talking to that child, so I shouldn't interrupt. You may simply see that child and say, oh, I want to tell that child something because I like that person. And you may barge right into the conversation. What's that? That's the exact same thing except in a... When Dr. Levine visited Lauren, he was not surprised that she was so disorganized. Is this generally the way you organize your notebook? This is yeah. Now, I'm interested it's a lot in... Uh, better this... than my other notebook. It is? This yeah. is one of your best notebooks. Yeah. Lauren's notebook is a mishmash of unnecessary junk and original poetry. I would look at a poem and uh, it was wonderful, creative, just wonderful, perceptive poem reflecting the sensitivity and freedom of her thinking. And then we'd turn to another page and there'd be a crumpled up piece of paper there. And this is, how do we classify this? Trash. Trash, okay. She wasn't able to differentiate between trash and masterpieces. Chad. Right alongside of all of these traits is a little girl who's incredibly creative, fanciful, and eccentric. The question is, how do we help her get her act together without changing her very much? This new approach to learning differences has an answer for Lauren that is surprising in its simplicity. Lauren needs a kind of focus coach. Someone who, just like a football coach, coaches you to do this, do that. Someone to say, those pieces of paper, that's trash. Those pieces of paper, that's notes. You know, let's separate those two. Let's reorganize this. It literally, coach her uh, academically, also socially. The, that group of friends, you know, when you go into that group, don't walk in talking. Uh, first go in, listen, make eye contact, and then bring up what you have to say. So you can coach socially as well as you coach academically and coach organizationally. You're obviously bright, you're very capable. You're but learning how to focus is only part of the answer. Dr. Skip Baker is convinced that before Lauren can truly learn, a flaw in her brain chemistry needs to be addressed. What I'd like to do is to go over with you the first two tovas that we did. He explains how the brain's chemistry works. As we work with our brain, remember, it's only the front part of the brain, right above the eyes, that has to do with your concentration. It's not the whole brain. A chemical in the brain, dopamine, stimulates nerves that sustain attention. The people are built with differences in the way that dopamine transmission works. Either you don't have enough, you have different receptors over here that aren't working very well. Dr. Baker believes that in Lauren's brain, the dopamine delivery system isn't working properly, so her concentration lapses much more quickly. And there are nerve pathways that go right to that part. He believes that Lauren's dopamine can be recharged and her focus restored if she takes a stimulant medication such as Ritalin. Parts of the brain are energized by different nerve pathways. My suspicion is on the basis of experience, I think it's going to turn her around and make things so much easier for her. This is the Tova test that we did with the single dose of Ritalin. There was almost a two standard deviation jump in auditory processing in association with the Ritalin. That's a dramatic, dramatic difference. 
Dr. Baker's recommendation has jolted the family into a controversy raging across America. Are we raising a generation of over-medicated kids? Lauren's father, Mike, feels that there must be other options. Are the same side effects noticed when you use caffeine versus Ritalin? Yeah, they absolutely really are. identical. Yeah, absolutely are. Being a parent, any foreign substance like a drug scares the hell out of me. I. Uh, taking it as an adult, I uh, wouldn't see an issue, but something with my baby girl, no, I just, even though I've read about it and I understand what it's supposed to do and Dr. Baker has gone through uh, what the benefits are and he's described basically no uh, s side effects, still, to me, it's somewhat of an unknown and maybe it's just my ignorance, but it, it's somewhat terrifying for me. <laughs> Lauren, too, is worried about how drugs will affect her. And I don't want to be normal. What? I don't want to... You don't well, want I want to be normal, just, I mean, I want to be original, also. Oh, okay. Because that's how Einstein was. Really? He, was, he wasn't too good in school, right. but he turned out to be Einstein. Right. Wonderful um, person. So, um, maybe some people who grow up and have very original ideas. Many learning experts now sympathize with worries about overprescription of such medicines as Ritalin. The problem, they say, is that these drugs have been misunderstood as a cure-all rather than merely as a tool. Is it a cure? Absolutely not. But you learn compensatory strategies, habits, while you're taking the medication that will carry over to when you're not taking the medication. So it, 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 by allowing you to focus better, it allows you to better learn these strategies that we're trying to teach them. I mean, that just makes intuitive sense. You know, I mean, if you turn up the, if you turn on the lights in the room, you can learn better than trying to learn in the dark. Much better. Yeah. Lauren's parents feel they have found an answer to their child's perplexing mind. Yeah. Her chronic dawdling was caused by uneven brain chemistry. But part of the proposed solution, medication, still makes them uneasy. So Lauren's parents, like so many of us, have to struggle with the decision of whether to medicate their daughter. They wonder if they risk losing the fanciful and eccentric girl they love. When we return to her story, we'll discover their decision. Meanwhile, Nathan Van Hoy is finishing the second grade. His particular problem, phonemic awareness, is still making a tangle of the learning process. He spit some slime out to blind. Our research shows us that if we don't get to the kids by about nine years of age with strong, efficient strategies to help them understand sound structure, the probability that they will learn to read is, is very minimal. To help him, the school wants to put Nathan in the resource room, where he will be learning with kids of all ages and abilities, from subtle problems like his own, to more severe ones like autism. His mom, Lois, worries that Nathan, whose social skills are his strength, might feel stigmatized and isolated in a resource room. The scholarly part of me knows that these are intelligent people and that the evaluations they made are appropriate. The mom part of me thinks that it stinks. They're asking me my input, how do, you know, what do I want done? Um, God, do you put your, your kid in a classroom where you know he's going to fail? Does he have a chance to succeed in this other system? In the end, Lois decides she has no better choice. So Nathan's friends go one way, he goes another. Something a horse will eat, Nathan. Um, hey. Hey. Hey, May. He had great gains. Um, he advanced um, almost three levels in reading. Um, he's performing on grade level with his math. 
Ray. R-A-Y. Good. He's secure here. He's doing well. I couldn't be happier with what he's achieved. Do you have any? Do you have anything harder? This is an example of something he wrote during journal time after we got our rest. But as winter approaches, there are signs of the familiar failures. He looks big when he is standing up. He also reminds me of Jeff Gordon running around the running around the cage just to see where, what kind of errors he makes. Nathan's mom is learning that her son's tortured progress is going to involve a series of small gains and more than a few setbacks. He's kind of reached a plateau and it's, it's going to take that extra effort and that extra thinking to, to go to the next level. Yeah. And that's kind of what I wrote in my... Guided by advice from learning experts, Nathan's teachers are tackling his problem with reading and writing by focusing on his particular way of learning. Our O-U-T-R. They hope to employ his coping mechanism, his strong memory, to attack his weaknesses. Now, record it for me. O -U Drilling him with intensive and repetitive language sounds at school and at home. All right, listen to it two more times and record it one more. I pray every night that Nathan can be the best he can be and that one day the light bulb's going to come on and things will be easy for him. There are days when you think, will it ever happen? But I don't allow myself to think that it won't. Man, fist, fits, fish, cast. Good job. It's a year later, and Nathan is still in the resource room. The biggest improvement is he knows sounds now. He knows how to put sounds together into words. He can manipulate sounds in words. Say it fast, get ready. Fist. Nathan's learning problems will never go away. He will learn ways to compensate, which he is beginning to do at this point. He has a lot of support in his family and his family shed. will make sure that he gets the right help he needs. Shed, can, not. The biggest challenge for Nathan comes at the end of the fourth grade when he is required to take a state mandated test to move up to the fifth. The success of the test is measured in one, two, three, and four with three and four being acceptable scores. You're told no one ever makes a four that if you were able to achieve a four on this end of year writing it test, it would be equivalent to a high school um, performance. His mom, Lois, is extremely worried, but she is also able to get him accommodations, like dictating his answers instead of writing them. Now she can only wait for the results. The day his test course came back, Mrs. Marshall called me. And she said, you need to sit down, I need to tell you about Nathan's scores. So immediately my hot heart dropped, um, thinking, you know, oh God, this is not good. And she just starts giggling. And she said, Nathan has done really well. She said, Nathan scored a 4.0 on his end of the year writing test. Nathan is one of only four students in the entire school to have a perfect score. He has proved that he can use his strengths to overcome his weaknesses. I've learned that in some parts of your life that you want to quit when things are difficult. But some way or another, um, you'll get over that obstacle, even if it takes you slow slow like the tortoise and other people are the hare and they finish but slowly you'll get there his ability to verbalize himself his keen memory his attention to detail scored him the highest score that's success nathan's in fifth grade this year Nathan Van Hoy's struggle to untangle the basic process of learning 
seems bound for a happy ending. Now let's get back to the story of that 11-year-old girl, the dawdler, whose parents shied away from Ritalin. They've decided to avoid medication and to try instead a brand new charter school where maybe new friends and a clean slate will be enough to help the problem. I feel like the new school is a better opportunity even without the Ritalin. What happened to the Spanish? Everyone hopes Lauren will get off to a fresh start. Uh, the second page you don't need to look at. What is La Boca? It was the same thing as it was last week. Open your mouth. There you go. In the first weeks of school, Lauren's parents believe they have made the right decision. This is the beginning of the fourth week of school, and um, she seems certainly to have made a number of friends. She's extremely excited about what she's doing and the environment she's in, and the new friends she has. So she's on a she's on a real high. Skills. Putting Lauren in a new environment helps for a while. Somebody tell me how we measure the length from the golf ball from the top of the balcony. To the it turns out that her new surroundings act like a substitute stimulant. But then the stimulation wears off. And Lauren is no more focused, no more organized than before. The truth comes out in a pivotal meeting between Lauren, her parents, and teachers at her new school introduce your folks to what we do in our writing class so mm -hmm. can you explain to them how we go about constructing sure. writing? Um, reading journal I'm usually too stuck in the books to remember to do the journal <laughs> <laughs> it's true and the history project if I just had information I would be with the rest of the class but I just need to get that information so we should probably go to a library soon when's it due? Um, some of the drafts were already due. So you're past due at this point. Yeah. Including the fact that I've asked you numerous times, so many times I can't even count about this project. Mm -hmm. Because other kids have talked about it. Why would you tell me that this is getting done when it's not? It was. So what, you thought I just wouldn't know about it? Well, actually, in the class stuff, I was getting stuff done in class. Sounds weak. You know, you could just see the look come over her face of, oh gosh, I, I'm caught now because mom's here and the teacher's here, so she couldn't tell me one story and tell the teacher a different story anymore. So out of the three, from the balcony, the second floor, and the slide, which one do you think is going to have? Lauren's parents now know that her academic difficulties still linger and that the social problems have never gone away. Would you describe yourself as popular now? Um... Not exactly, because, I mean, I have lots of friends, but that doesn't mean that I'm popular. There are kids that tend to pick on her, and quite a few, actually, that will tease her because she gets emotional real easy. So some kids are aware of that. She doesn't um, seem to have the social skills to give and take. Um, she can be kind of very um, frustrated when someone doesn't respond to her in the way that she expects and then she re reacts to that and can be volatile right back. What the heck? I was there! As far on the social ladder, I would say the lower end. In reality, Lauren has made only one close friend, Veronica. Really good friend. Someone I can count on all the time, no matter what, even if it means, like, she might lose a friend, she'd stand up for me. But even that relationship is now in jeopardy. Her very best friend is not returning to the school, and I haven't had the heart to tell her. And how would your life be if you didn't have Veronica in it? My life would not be too wonderful without a, a friend like Veronica. So I expect tears, and I don't blame her. I'll probably cry, too. Do you guys want to go no. jump rope? No. And you know, children will tell you over and over again that the real pressure that they experience in school is social pressure, not academic pressure. That when you come home at night feeling really terrible, more often than not, it's a social setback, not an academic setback. And I think Lauren is suffering. <laughs> Lauren is wounded.
because she doesn't quite have the social skills. You're going to know whether it's making a difference or not and what kind of a difference it's making. The experiment at a new environment has been a serious disappointment. So Lauren's family revisits the issue of medication. Lauren's father is still reluctant. I just see that as uh, the pop culturalists take care of all the kids with Ritalin. And, that I, I, and I'm, I'm concerned that this condition is not something that goes away when she becomes 18 or 28. I mean, because we're not obligated. Dr. Baker reminds Lauren's parents that a medication like Ritalin is just a tool that can focus her, like turning on the lights in a room. But the rest of the job of learning will still be up to her. Without medication, the doctor warns, Lauren may find other ways to turn on the lights for herself. The, the best you could hope for is she's going to smoke tobacco, as opposed, that's probably the best, as opposed to pot, alcohol, cocaine, every single illegal drug that people use except for hallucinogens raises the dopamine levels in the frontal lobes. That's what it does. It makes those part of the brain fire better. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean with your family environment and everything else that that would happen, but we do know if you're deficient in these things that you're at greater risk than if you're not. That gets Mike Smith's attention. Now, finally, he is ready to take the leap. I, I, I'm not uh, adverse to trying something, and I'd also like to get... One year later, Lauren is in eighth grade. She wears a watch and carries a date book to help keep her organized. The adults in her life have also learned new ways to help her focus. That's it, Lauren, go! Go, go, go! And Lauren and her doctor have settled on the right medication for her, a new time-release stimulant. So we tried it and you know, she didn't grow horns or anything, so we were we thought, well, let's let's keep keep the course. Let's see what kind of trend she has in terms of homework and being a social kid and things like that. Oh, I got your ball, go! And it just turned out okay. I wish we had done it sooner. Now, within a period of about one month, it became very apparent that their daughter was functioning totally differently. She started to improve uh, getting homework done. She started better listening. Within a period of about six weeks, we started to see some social changes. She started interacting better. She was saying she wasn't being left out as much. She was making more friends. Her grades started to go up. Oh, I like those. The and yeah. buns, those are so cute. Yeah, I know. When I take the medicine, I just automatically think before I do something. I guess it just makes me think faster. I don't know. Just, it's not like it really changes me. It just like, Tunes me up a little. It's one thing $25 for like a skirt. I know. My friend Brooke would like this. I'm not super popular, but I'm not like not popular. My friends are really great. They're nice and kind to everyone. They're really, really nice. <laughs> I know. The whole family's stress over her struggles has decreased dramatically because they didn't know what to do and how to help her. Um, this isn't just the person who starts to do well, but it's the whole family that starts to do better when they don't worry so much. 90% of the time I can tell if she's forgotten to take her medication. It's just a much smoother life together when she's taking her medications. And she feels better because she's a happier person. You, I mean, you can see it in her face when she's taking the medication. I use some and it's like, oh, uh, I'll get it back to you, but that's all right. I yeah. believe in my mom. Trust her. I seriously need to go in the store and go shopping. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. It's so pretty. Like, uh, but now, just to show you how complicated these learning problems can be, here's a story that is the flip side of Lauren's. Across the country in New York City, there is a young girl whose social success has been masking a painful learning problem. A problem that, because it exists in the inner city, might have been written off as something other than the neurological disconnect that it really is. Eleven-year-old Sarah Lee Harris has always had lots of friends. 
Some of my friends are Amber, Rashida, Shayna, Akima, Kimmy. Sarah Lee is the youngest of four children. Her mom has one simple goal for her children, a good, solid education. My oldest daughter, when she graduated from high school, she went to Queensboro College. My son graduated from high school. The twins graduate this year. I graduated from high school and went to college and business school. So, you know, it's important to get ahead in life. Sarah Lee keeps up the family tradition by attending the Children's Storefront School in Harlem, where at first she is a standout student. And to everybody who knows her, Sarah Lee is a leader, highly motivated and highly verbal. She can really hold a conversation. She will talk to you and say, all right, Sally, just a minute, just, just take a break for a minute. Go ask you something to drink or, or, or get a fruit or something, just to hush her up for just a few minutes. Don't worry, wait, you been in the store, right? For a long time. Told you, feeling it, told feeling it. But in the fourth grade, something changes. She got real shy in history. She wouldn't participate in classroom activities, in history class. She wouldn't come with the answer. She would do her homework, but it would take her a little longer. So she got tired of being slower in the work and she kept saying, Mom, something is not right. Like, I, didn't, I, I couldn't understand. My comprehension wasn't well, and my vocabulary wasn't well, and my reading skills wasn't well. Her teacher also notices a puzzling difference between Sarah Lee's personality in class and out. By nature, she's very, you know, energetic and outgoing yeah. social. But in class, a lot of times, it's the opposite. She'll listen, and she's not a behavior issue. And she'll sort of look at you, focus right at you. But I always wonder, you know, how much, you know, she's really absorbing. To find out why Sarah Lee is suddenly tongue-tied in class, the school's resource teacher takes her to see speech and language specialist Donna Orloff. I'm going to read a sentence to you. And Orloff starts by testing Sarah Lee's basic language skills. Look at some pictures, and you can start up here at A. Um, lion, horse, mouse. She has very good language for single words. She knows a lot of labels, a lot of nouns. And she uses them, and she understands them. But there were other words that were associated, not the direct label, but associated with the pictures, and that posed difficulty for her. Perfect. Point two, swine. So, we get to swine. She had no idea what swine is. She's heard it. She's heard it from reading Charlie's Web but she doesn't have that rich storage system that enables her to tap the vocabulary and to retrieve the words that she needs. Our brains are basically a very complex storage and retrieval system where every piece of information that comes into you, you put it someplace so that you can refer to it later on. If you see a St. Bernard walking down the street, your retrieval system goes to your storage system, pulls out all of the note cards that it has on dogs, goes through it till it finds St. Bernard and says, oh look, there's a St. Bernard. All this happens in a, in a millisecond. And then you take that card and put it back where it belongs so when you need it next time, you can find it. Leather. The problem with these kids is that the storage and retrieval systems are very complicated and generally very confused. Stitches. So they will go and take the card out Super. and then put it back in the wrong place. You. That ability to make mental connections, to go from one file drawer to the next, also affects the way kids think abstractly. A student talking about a trip says, it's still up in the air. Mm -hmm. Probably he's talking about a trip going around the world. Mm -hmm. This is the child who only sees the picture of the pig is the pig, the picture of the train is the train. If it's up in the air, he's got to be on an airplane. Language is never that one-to-one, -one, rigid, concrete correlation. It's much richer and much more demanding, particularly when you get to fourth grade, that's when it starts. I'm not surprised in Sarah Lee's case that things began to unravel at third and fourth grade. If Sarah Lee is a bright child, she was probably able to fake her way through first and second grade. You can fake your way through. That's it. 
Do you listen to your friends talk about the story they've read and then you use those answers when the teacher asks you the questions? Well, we, do you swear by Zeus? But around third or fourth grade is when you begin to deal with expressive language problems. In other words, the language is there. I don't know it! But it's almost locked away. The language is inside the brain. They have an inner language, they know what they want to say, and they just can't express it. They can't get the words out. To make a paragraph that matches the picture. Like sometimes when I'm in a class and my teacher, she asks us, like, what's the answer? And I raise my hand and I'll know the answer, but then when I say it, it won't come out the way I, I was thinking of it. What about the way Homer used the gun in that episode? What do you think that they, they were trying to say, Sarah Lee? He used it in, he used it instead, he used the gun to, he used the gun to shoot place instead of shooting people. Okay, my question. When you think about it, you, you thinking in your head, I didn't, I didn't want to say that. Did he use it for what it was really intended for? Sometimes it's a little embarrassing because people, they laugh and mumble under their breath that's the wrong you answer all of that that's that embarrassing you are not a criminal before you get a gun sarah lee you know, masters the language of tv shows and commercials and the playground but she locks up when confronted by the more fully dimensional language encountered in books and in the classroom experts say she has expressive language deficiency she understands well but she has trouble explaining what she knows. The expert strategy, a full immersion language treatment. She needs a lot of practice talking in complete sentences, uh, talking on a more literate level of things, really talking about issues. What was, what was Clinton's position in the article that you took your notes We want to build these muscles, these expressive language muscles, because uh, one of the best ways to to learn to talk right is to have plenty of practice. It's, it's almost like working out for a sport. And she has to do that. She needs a verbal workout. You need to be a risk taker. You need to try a new word. You need to make that leap. But you have to be comfortable. You have to be confident. You have to know you're in a safe place to do it. And someone's got to be there to help give you the ammunition to take that risk. But once you start taking it, and once you start succeeding, it just, you know, the ripple effect is wonderful. There, it's very positive. So the prescription for Sarah Lee is a kind of immersion therapy, almost like learning a foreign language. There will be flashcard drills, practice conversations, lots of reading, and new vocabulary words over and over and over. If she keeps it up, the experts believe she can overcome her expressive language deficiency. What should you do if you find someone's wallet or purse in a store? You should, if the person is not too far, you should run and give it to them or you can... One year later, the assessment of Sara Lee's progress is indeed hopeful. And let them know that you have their I hope if I lose my wallet, you're the one who <laughs> finds it. This past year has been a year of real growth for her. She's contributing more in classes now and she's doing more reading. And she's found ways to help herself. Any bacteria or... And that alone, it's, it's like shooting baskets and... Uh, to prepare for a basketball game. The more she does, the better she gets at it. Sarah Lee has improved dramatically. Well, here are her total reading scores. Last year, in the seventh grade, she made a dramatic leap. Her comprehension score went from fourth grade second month up to seventh grade, nearly a three-year gain. What's very distinct in her community is a division between blacks and whites, right? What specifically about the way that they speak? How does she feel about the way mama speaks? <coughs> she feels embarrassed because like, she's still using improper English. She feels it's improper English. Great. What else? What other issues about races have come up? Remember I've definitely noticed a willingness in Sara Lee to think beyond the first initial thought. She's starting to push herself beyond that, um, beyond 
cliches. She um compares how the schools yeah. and stamps are different from the schools. She's highly intelligent and she's a good thinker. She's capable of thinking through ideas. But perhaps the best witness to Sara Lee's progress is Sara Lee herself. So, yeah. Remember okay, so. this moment from a year ago? He used it instead. He used the gun to he used the gun to shoot plays instead of shooting people. <laughs> okay, my question is though. I have matured a lot. I've participated in my classes. I've been behaving well. I've been doing my homework. My grades have been pulled up. I've been working very hard, and like I've been overcoming the mistakes that I did many years ago. It's clearly beginning to happen for her, and I think this is going to be a wonderful year. She's a wonderful girl, and I think she will leave here and go on to high school and college, and I hope that whatever her wishes are, they'll be realized. So far, our journey through these young lives has been a difficult but mostly hopeful one. But what about a kid who wasn't identified early or who wasn't targeted for medication therapy or one-on-one -on -one attention? This is the story of a teenager who slipped through the cracks, an object lesson in missed signals. On the edges of Boston, in this neighborhood known as Hyde Park, many families are scratching to make a living. One family, the Dunnings, is raising four kids here. Adam is their second son. He was just a good little kid, very well liked, always um, neighbors and teachers and um, CCD teachers and coaches would always tell me, what a well-mannered son you have. His mother realized early on that Adam had a problem. Adam and I would read together every night and he couldn't identify words that he should have been familiar with. When he started second grade, I knew that there was a building block that was kind of beginning to crumble. The school teachers kept saying, he's just lazy, you know, and uh, his personality carried him through. Or, uh, Adam's a good kid, he's just, you know, we'll worry about him later. Finally, by the fifth grade, Adam's problems in school were obvious to his teachers. He was given a battery of tests, but school officials assured the Dunnings their son was average and would do just fine. I think the problem with the initial testing was that when you do an IQ test, um, you've got 12 subtests, and the, the half of them are language-based and half of them are not. So you end up getting scores that get added together and that Adam's scores added, added together come up as average. But Adam, struggling with even the most basic reading, writing, and spelling tasks, had the feeling he wasn't even average. I felt embarrassed at some times, like when I couldn't pronounce words, and then other kids would pronounce a word for me. Say, hurry up, you don't know how to read. I get comments like that all the time. By now, his parents began to really worry about Adam. They asked the school for more tests. And by the end of seventh grade, the school had a bombshell for the Dunnings. They told us that Adam was reading on a third grade level, and he's in the seventh grade. So what happened to the fourth grade, the fifth grade, and the sixth grade? I mean... Something's wrong. I, at that point, I did think I was dumb or stupid. Like, why can't I read? I mean, all my friends go to Latin, and Boston Latin, one of the best schools. Probably the best school in Massachusetts, like an exam school. They read fine. Why can't I read? Adam was too old for the early intervention remedies, and the school's solution to help Adam sounded better on paper than it was in reality. 
They said Adam needs a small classroom setting. And what are they sending? It's like going in a prison. He's down in the cellar in a little room about this size with 12 other kids. So instead of working on ways to make it in school, Adam started working on ways to get out of school. I went to the school and uh, went room to room to room to his teachers. Some of his teachers had never seen Adam. And this is two months into the school year, had never seen him. You take school out of that, that age, you take it away, you take it out of the picture, what else is there? There's marijuana, there's stealing cars. I mean, what else is there for a kid to do? So you run the streets. When you run the streets, you get in trouble, you make bad choices. Adam was so, he was mad, he was, he can't read. Adam's parents knew it was time for professional help. At the Boston Medical Center, Dr. Andrea Weiss, a clinical psychologist, gave Adam a new battery of tests. What we're gonna do first is I'm gonna give you some reading lists. And what I'd like you to do is just read down the list out loud, and if you come to a word you don't know... And you Dr. Weiss's it, test it. provide a kind of road map to when Adam's learning skills hit the wall. Bridge, neighbors, coverage, incusive. Incusive, okay. Let me just take that word for you and break, break it down into syllables and see if it helps. As he got up in grades and his reading vocabulary got larger, he was faced with all these multisyllabic words that he couldn't decode. In. Cues. Uh, cues. It would. It could be cues, but if this is qua. Quiz. Quiz. Good. And quiz. Uh, tiv. Good. So can you put it together? Inquisitive. Excellent. Okay, go on. Clever. Right. Uh huh. Success. And Adam's reading problems were affecting his spelling and writing as well. What's your best guess with success? How do you think it's spelled? Good. That's pretty close. By the time he got to ninth grade, he was getting no special ed help, and he was really at a distinct disadvantage. He fell apart. He stopped going to class. He stopped doing his homework, because essentially, it was way beyond what he could do. And when Jane said, oh, he needs help, people said, oh, you know what? If you look at his profile, he's solidly average. There's nothing going on here. He's not trying. He's lazy. And they gave kind of behavioral descriptions to something that wasn't behavioral at all. To be told over and over again, you know, you're not quite cutting the mustard, it breaks down your self-esteem. And you have to go somewhere else to get your self-esteem built up. And kids get into trouble and they go looking for things that are more exciting than being told every day that you're dumb. I think there's a huge payback for not providing kids with what they need. Just as the experts could have predicted, Adam turned to drugs and alcohol. When I drink, it's just to forget about everything. If I'm really having a tough time, so I can't take this anymore. Not just have to go drink some beers to let it all just get away. There's been a lot of evidence of uh, drug use. Continuously money being stolen no we, matter where kinda, it was. We're kind of guilty of not overlooking it thinking well you know you know so he needed some money but when it gets into the thousands you know, you've let it go too far, and uh, it got there. Then, one night, the phone call every parent dreads. We get a phone call from the state police. I thought he's getting ready to tell us that somebody had been killed. I thought about, how do, how do you plan a funeral for a kid who, who doesn't... Uh, 
doesn't seem to want to want to be part of of your family anymore. He doesn't want to um, it doesn't want to be a kid. Adam was safe, but in deep trouble. The police claimed that he had crashed a stolen car. The next will soon be confronted by that terrible prospect. But right now, the story of another young boy sending alarming signals that he is headed for trouble. His parents, desperate for help, can feel him slipping away. Ten-year-old Nathan Suggs lives in rural Bear Creek, North Carolina, where he leads a lonely existence. A bright boy who loves science, he cannot succeed in school. Forgetful and willful, Nathan has been a handful from the beginning. Getting out of line and talking in class and... Those sorts of things. Kicking other kids, you know. It's even... From even kindergarten on, mm -hmm. you know, there was signs of discipline problems. So Nathan's parents had him tested. They came up with a diagnosis of ADD without hyperactivity. And so we knew that pencils rolling on the desk or dropping or any, anything like that would probably take him off task. It's like a, like a jigsaw puzzle. Well, some days I wake up and it's just like two or three pieces to put together and other times it's like a 500 3D puzzle or something. Ritalin was prescribed, but Nathan's parents learned there was no magic pill. We upped it, it went up to 10 milligrams. It helped for a little while, but we still had the problems with getting the assignments home. So his parents took him off Ritalin, but now they had nothing. He would be real sad that he was not able to learn, that uh, people didn't like him, that they yeah. were out to, you know, ridicule him or make fun of him. Um, he got to where he hated everything as far as school. He didn't want to yeah. learn, didn't want to read, didn't, didn't want to write. Didn't want to go. He didn't want to go. A lot of times when, you know, he's not in a good mood and he's real irritable and, you know, says stuff like, you know, why am I even here and stuff like that, I get, I get real worried. I don't, you know, I hope he doesn't get too drastic. And when he said, I just shouldn't be alive, I said, this child does not have to go through this. His parents are desperate. For them, public school is not working, and private school is too expensive. So his mom, Edie, is trying homeschooling. But Edie is not prepared for how difficult teaching Nathan will be. Okay, where were you? The most basic schoolwork is a chore for Nathan and a challenge for his mother. Nine times six is tw is um fifty four. Mm -hmm. Do I put it under here? Don't you? Do you remember what to do next? You put it under here. Okay. What do you put? Five four. Mm -hmm. Nope. Five four. You put five four. Okay. Oh You're, no. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to remind you. By early summer, Nathan's frustration has turned to anger. He is kicking doors hitting his brother. He loses control and that part is is what's frightening. His family is becoming increasingly fearful that Nathan's plummeting self-esteem might cause him to hurt himself or others. Sometimes I can't stop crying and like I'm just in my bed with my head down. I just Get sad. A little while ago, like um, last year, mm -hmm. I was like, I could just kill myself. I tried to run away. I just felt like um, no one really wanted me to be there. 
Nathan's mom, desperate to do something to improve her son's self-image, begins to look outside Bear Creek for help. An hour down the road are the offices of pediatrician Mel Levine, whose specialty is finding out what's going on with kids like Nathan. You copy it for me. Dr. Levine tests for strengths and weaknesses. You know, for kids, success is like a vitamin, and it's a real vitamin deficiency to grow up success deprived. Let's just compare it to the original. The testing shows that Nathan excels at visual and spatial perceptions. Fantastic. What I would like you to do next is write the alphabet for me from A to Z and join all the letters together as if the whole alphabet was one was one long word and I'm going to time you to see how long it takes you okay ready go along with his tally sheet of strengths there are significant weaknesses um. I forgot how to do one letter. Were you forgetting how to make the letter, or were you forgetting which letter came next? Forgetting how to write it, or, um, yeah, how to write it. So you knew what letter you wanted to write, and could you picture it in your mind? I could picture it in my mind, but I just couldn't. Couldn't um, remember the procedure for making that letter. So let me give you some others now and see how you do Dr. It. Levine now knows something vital. Nathan knows what the letter K looks like, but it's simply too much work to write it down. Kids like this have what is known as an output problem. These are kids for whom work is too much work. Effort is too much effort. And they sit down to do something and you think they have to climb the Matterhorn. And these same kids tantalize everyone because their intake is so good. They're so good at understanding things. They're so good at analyzing. Often they're very creative. A lot of times they're a wellspring of phenomenal ideas but to be productive, to get some output, to be efficient in your output, is sort of out of the question. Nathan, you see all these designs here? It's as if within the mind of the child with a learning problem, there are three clocks. The clocks are set, set at different times and moving at different speeds. So the clocks are totally out of sync with each other, and the child is generally out of sync with his environment. But the law of averages will tell you, if you take three clocks, set them at different times and move them to different speeds, eventually, bingo, 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 there will come a time where the three of them are all telling the same time. And when the clocks are in sync, there's this incredible forward movement on the part of the child for a day or a week or a month, if you're lucky, this incredible forward movement and progress, and then the clocks get out of sync again. The moment of truth, called demystification. You are like a wonderful car, like a Mercedes or a Jaguar but it has a very small gas tank so that when you try to think or do a lot of work it runs out of fuel pretty easily. Demystification I think may be the most important movement in this field in the last 10 years and that is explaining to the child what the problem is. If you have a child with diabetes one of the first things you do is explain to the child this is what diabetes is these are the foods you can eat this is what's happening to your body when you don't eat the proper food and explain line and verse yet when a child has a learning problem we try to protect the child from it i've had parents say to me he doesn't know he has a learning problem indeed he does and sometimes a child takes great comfort in the diagnosis in knowing i'm not the only person that has it i'm not stupid like the kids tell me in the school bus i'm not lazy like the teacher tells me every day there's really a name for this the second problem you have is uh what we call a graphomotor problem you don't have very good control over the very little muscles at the ends of your fingers and you know what you do because of that? You try to get rid of them. You know how you get rid of them? By putting your thumb over these two fingers. And you bear down real hard. And you end up writing with your wrists. And that's too slow. And then you know what happens? You have to work so hard to form the letters that it's hard to do that and spell at the same time. And it's hard to do that and have good ideas at the same time. You're so good spatially with this thing. Dr. Levine tells Nathan his strengths can help overcome his weaknesses. For example, his ability to draw this complicated design from memory can help him visualize facts like history dates that otherwise he would forget. 
remembering dates is a lot of detail. But it won't be a lot of detail for you if you make a diagram of it and remember it as a visual pattern. I have evidence that you're very smart. You need to convince yourself of that. Because when you can do your thing... It was probably the first time he's heard somebody since his second grade teacher tell him how great he was. High priority. Yeah. Instead of ADD, yeah. you know, this huge thing, it, it was really specific and it was something that seems manageable. So it's, it's very encouraging. But Nathan's parents think he needs one other thing, discipline. One year later, the ranks of the Hargrave Military Academy include Nathan Suggs. We get a lot of boys that are very smart and intelligent, have a lot of potential, but for whatever reason they come here because um, they do not think they can do it. Cadet Suggs. For his parents, sending their son here is a big sacrifice. But they believe it's his big chance. For this year, we cleaned out his college fund. And my parents also contributed. And so, I don't know exactly what we would do for next year. I love you. I love you. I've missed you so much. He lives at Hargrave. And this fall has been very difficult for me but I'm hoping that he will take in some of the discipline and make it his own. I'm feeling happier. I have more self-discipline. I'll probably have more than I have now at the end of the year. And it'll probably be a whole lot easier. You look so nice. I've seen Nathan's self-confidence grow in the last four or five months. And so I feel like, you know, even the mistakes that we've made, you know, have somehow turned toward building his character. And, um, and he's, he's, he's learned a lot. I'd say just don't worry about what other people think. It's, and if you feel bad about yourself, just try to, just try to make yourself feel important and do something be proud of it no matter what but Nathan's parents know better than to invest too much hope just yet they know that kids like Nathan often have good starts in new environments later this spring they'll know more about whether they have finally found an answer for their boy now back to Adam Dunning's story He's out of the psychiatric ward. But now Adam's parents have come to this courthouse. Their son is on trial for breaking and entering. He's been given a court-appointed lawyer. His parents are told that if he's found guilty, their boy will be in the custody of the state until he's an adult. The prosecution makes its case. So I'm just the testimony you're about to give to the court. The class now hearing will be the truth. I saw a glimpse of his face, and I saw the outline of his face, and I said, oh, that's Adam. Should he be in school and judged with the crime? It doesn't take the jury long to render its verdict. Guilty or not guilty? Will we find the defendant guilty? As they say goodbye to their son, Jane Dunning comes to grips with a harsh new reality. Adam's birthday is four days from today. and. I didn't expect to have to ask somebody else permission uh, to bring him a birthday cake. Four days later, it's Adam's 16th birthday, celebrated in jail. But as terrible as it is to visit him here, Adam's parents are in for a surprise. When the sunset looks for the moon... Their son is finally in an educational environment that seems to suit him. 
The classes are small, and because so many of these kids have learning problems, the teachers here have found a way to get through to them. Mercury has a raw crust made of the same kind of rock found on Earth. Beneath the crust, it is thicker mantel layer of the same material. You have to appeal to more of their senses in your teaching. If you, you should almost check a checklist. Okay, we got we got sound going on. All right, uh, hearing hearing. Uh, what am I doing on visual? Am I doing any artwork? What am I doing on touch? Am I getting their hands engaged? Um, all of that, and I, I think that happens a lot in the elementary or lower grades, and we figure high school, they don't need to do that anymore, and I think we're very, very wrong. Would you like to visit that town here? It's really the first time Adam Dunning has any positive feelings about learning. I feel good about going to school. I mean, school here is fun. It's like the teachers care. They help you out like regular school should be. He has come to believe jail time is actually good for him. Me being locked up was good for a learning experience for me because I stayed out. If I didn't get locked up, I'd probably be dead or in a lot worse trouble. I probably wouldn't be at a treatment facility. I'd probably be back wearing an orange suit. For years, Adam says, he used drugs and alcohol to blunt the pain of his failures in school. He's clean and sober now, but worries about how long that can last. The only thing I'm really afraid of going back to school is how the kids around me, the pressures. They've seen me before. They know how I acted before. I've never been to high school when I was clean. I mean, it wasn't 30 days where I wasn't using, so, so I think kids are going to push my buttons. And that's the thing that scares me the most about going back to school just other kids. Lionel, Michael Young, Kenneth Smith... And After three short months, Adam is starting again at Boston High. His brief success in the jail classroom is a stark contrast to what he is about to face. It was like asking a baby to read. And I said it was like trying to make gold out of, a, out of straw, like... And rumple steel skin. My mom said it was like trying to make silk purse out of silk. So there, so there. Adam is still well below grade level, and Dr. Andrea Weiss worries that there is nothing in place to help him. When I went back to test him, he hadn't made any progress, but he shouldn't have. There was no way for him to make progress because he needs specialized instruction. He's not going to get it by osmosis. He's not going to stand in a room and it's going to, you know, kind of, you know, go through his pores. It's not going to happen. He needs somebody to say, look, this is the way to do it. This is the structure. This is the recipe. It works every time. And then he'll own it. What's that called? Food chain. Exactly. Food chain. Adam has been placed in two special ed classes. But the kids here have such a wide variety of learning problems that, ironically, Adam appears to be doing better than he really is. One element in all organisms is carbon. Carbon, exactly. He's really academically, he's probably at the top of my classes. I have the whole gamut. You know, I have real low level acting out kids. Um, for the most part, we have acting out kids all together. But he, right. academically, he does very, very well when he wants to do it. I don't know. Some days I can go into school, sit down, not say a word, do everything, and everyone will say, wish we could have Adam like this all day without his hat on, with, without him talking, doing his, all his work, asking for more work. And other days, it's like, Adam comes in and starts goofing off. So real high school turned out to be another missed opportunity. He's a fragile guy right now. You know, I want him to be successful. But when you don't give a student what they need, the potential for really falling apart and giving up is so high that you really have to factor that in. It's a possibility. A year later, the school has expelled Adam for poor behavior. Once again, adrift, Adam has held a variety of odd jobs, and his mother fears he is back on drugs and alcohol. I was a little kid, I dreamed of going to college, going to school, but I 
I haven't finished high school, so I can't go to college. Now I have no high school diploma, and uh, I just work full time. It's like, what else do I have? Nothing. I see kids every single day that are like Adam. And sometimes I can get to them, and sometimes I can help them. And sometimes they slip by. But there's no reason that Adam needed to slip by. We had Adam. We had a hold on Adam. What Adam needed, the experts say, was the hardest thing to get. Early recognition of his problems and a consistent plan for dealing with them. In some states, the size of prisons are predicted on the basis of third grade and fourth grade literacy rates. So it does portend an alienation from society in a sense. And it's for those reasons, these downstream consequences of loss of self-esteem, poor academic development, limited vocabulary and other cognitive developments, difficulties with social relations, difficulties getting and holding jobs and getting in trouble with the law, that we consider reading problems to not only to be an educational issue, but a public health issue and a public health concern as well. Now Adam's parents are left with what they had at the very beginning, but only that. They still have hope. You change your dreams, you adjust, and you just, you settle from, I'd like him to graduate from college, to I hope he graduates from high school. And then you change the, well, from I hope he graduates from high school, that I hope he makes it. You've seen kids that are in jail one day and the next year they're in college and doing great. So he still has a shot at it. I'm not saying it's all over for him. You can't give up hope. That's, that's about all you do have is hope. Hope is what has motivated each of these families to share their stories tonight. Hope that we can all learn from their experiences and realize that no child with learning problems has to become a lost child. It's a lesson that's been a long time coming, including to families like mine, that with the right diagnosis, the proper management, and lots of hard work and ongoing support, none of our children is beyond rescue. There really are so many different ways to solve this problem called life. I mean, there really are. And if you look at successful people, nine times out of ten, they will tell you of stories of tremendous struggle. If you've got a different kind of brain, and I submit the most interesting people do, that's great. And as you're remediating all this stuff and learning how to be on time and all this stuff that you've got to learn how to do, Never lose sight of those strengths, those talents, because that is what is going to take you to great places. Misunderstood Minds continues on PBS Online. Find resources, explore strategies, and understand learning challenges firsthand. Misunderstood Minds at PBS.org. The Misunderstood Minds documentary is available from WGBH Boston Video for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. To place an order, please call 1-800-255-9424. Now stay tuned for the inspiring story of Raymond Hu, a 19-year-old Chinese brush painter born with Down syndrome, on Raymond's portrait.
Funding for Misunderstood Minds is provided in part by Schwab Learning, a service of the Charles and Helen Schwab Foundation, dedicated to helping kids with learning differences. And by ExxonMobil, because we value creative energy in all its forms. The Spencer T. and Ann W. Olin Foundation, dedicated to improving education and the environment. The Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation, supporting innovation and diversity in the arts, environment, and learning. The Roberts Foundation, providing learning opportunities for disadvantaged children and youth. And the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, supporting educational, cultural, and environmental initiatives.